Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Sunday, October the 29th, 2023. It is currently 524 p.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central Studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it because this is what I'm thinking. It is cold, ladies and gentlemen, here in West Texas. Currently outside, we're under a freeze watch, freeze warning. It's like sleet and snow has fell a little bit. More chance for that to come down. It's supposed to get maybe at like 20-something degrees, 27 degrees, I think, overnight. It is freezing. It is cold. I Look, I know, I know. The rest of you, you just kind of mock us and make fun of us. But I live in Texas, ladies and gentlemen. If I wanted the cold, I would go pick some horrible state where it gets cold. But I live in Texas, ladies and gentlemen. I should not be experiencing this, but it is cold outside. Very cold outside. But here I am in the studio and well, it's cold in the studio as well. But hopefully, hopefully, in spite of all of that, we can have a, hopefully a decent broadcast, something that will be beneficial and be positive. Now, if you've been paying any attention to this podcast, you know we have been un, uh, in a series, Understanding Law and Gospel, since I think October of 2022. We're now over a year into that series. We've done over 100 hours of teaching on the proper distinction between law and gospel. And this episode is going to be a part of that series, but it, we've kind of, we're going to take a little detour. We've been doing, you know, law and gospel redo, but now we're going to just kind of do a little standalone impromptu message based off something I saw today. And I think this should be very interesting. And in a, in a roundabout way, we are going to go back to the book, God's No and God's Yes by C.F.W. Walther, The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. And we're going to go back to thesis number, thesis number, let's see, one, two, three, four, thesis number five. We're going to go back to thesis number five for this episode. So in a roundabout way, we're still going backwards, but we're going to connect it to something that is very much today. It, it's uh, Well, let me say it this. It's very, let me say it this way. It's at least something very much today if you attended a Catholic church today, right? If you attended a Catholic church today, then what we're going to be talking about will be very, very relevant. So are you ready? It is Sunday evening. Typically, I would be getting ready to leave to be headed to Victory Baptist Church in Ovalo, Texas, but we're not having in-person services this evening. So here I am. Let's do something positive with this time. Let's dig into a little theology, a little uh, discussion about law and gospel, a little bit about Catholicism, a little bit about law, a little bit about gospel, just a whole lot of things. So I hope this will be beneficial. Now, I am going to begin. If you attended Mass today, you heard the following scriptures read. I have right in front of me the Catholic lectionary, because this Sunday is the 30th Sunday of the year. This is the 30th Sunday of the year. I think the lectionary cycle that they're in is, is uh, cycle A. I think that's the lectionary cycle that they're currently on, A. Now, of course, the lectionary new year begins with the beginning of Advent. That'll, be, that'll begin the new lectionary cycle if you're a Catholic. And I love to, some years, I follow the lectionary Every Sunday, every weekday, I follow the weekday lectionary and the Sunday lectionary because I like to see how they've collected the readings, how the readings possibly are connected. And, and one time at our church, we spent an entire year following the lectionary, right? Every Wednesday night was the Wednesday lectionary for that night. Sunday morning was the Sunday morning lectionary. Sunday night was dealing with the Sunday morning lectionary. And I, I, I think it was fun. We, we learned a lot of things. I think a lot of people saw how the liturgical calendar, we followed the liturgical calendar. Okay. Now we're in the season of Advent. Now we're in the season of Epiphany, right? We, we try to learn about those seasons, how they relate to church history. I think it was a, it was a, a positive experience, at least for me. Maybe the people who actually participated don't even remember it, but it was a positive experience for me. I am, I'm tempted, 
possibly to try to do something similar for 2024. Well, it'll begin before 2024. It, it'll begin the liturgical year of 2024 when uh, Advent begins this year. And if so, I may be doing some broadcasting and things about the liturgical seasons and following the lectionary for broadcast. I think it could be fun. I always think it's a, a great way to just cover a whole lot of scripture in one year. Because if you follow the Catholic lectionary for an entire year, you're going to be exposed to a, whole, a good portion of the Bible. So um, I think that that's uh, something that we may do. But today just happens to be one of those days. I don't know why. I thought, you know what? Let me pick up the, the lectionary. I had a little bit more time this morning. Since at Victory Baptist Church, we didn't have the Sunday school hour. We just had one service today. So I just happened to pick up the lectionary right here. Because when uh, our church was covering the lectionary for that year, we we bought we basically put lectionaries in every in every pew, right? So everyone could just come to church, grab the lectionary, and all you had to do is move the ribbon, and you knew exactly where we were in the church calendar. And so then we would read from the lectionary. Um, I thought it was again some a good investment, trying to help people see theological history, scriptural history. Lectionaries were very important in church history, so. I thought it was an interesting thing to do. So I just, I don't know. I was just kind of walking around the sanctuary, pick, picked up the uh, lectionary. And I'm like, what Sunday is, are we, are, are, is the, you know, those who follow the liturgical calendar, at least within the Catholic world, what's Sunday? And I had to look it up. I'm like, oh, it's the 30th Sunday. And it looks like it's cycle A. So I picked it up. And this is what I read. I am reading this from the Catholic lectionary. If you look this up in your Bible, it's probably going to read a little different. All right. So just keep that in mind. I'm, I'm, but I'm going to read directly from the Catholic lectionary. All right. This is the 30th Sunday of the year. Reading one, Exodus chapter 22, verses 20 through 26, a reading from the book of Exodus, a reading from the book of Exodus. Right underneath that, they have a little saying to try to kind of summarize. And it says, if you are harsh with the widow or the orphan, my anger will rage against you. So immediately that's giving you an idea, kind of a summarizing that this is dealing with how we treat people. In this particular case, they're emphasizing the widow and the orphan. That if you treat people wrong, if you treat people who are, who are less fortunate than you, if you treat people who are weak or vulnerable in a wrong kind of way, God will rage against you. His anger will rage against you seemingly to be the way they're summarizing it. But let's read the scripture as recorded in the Catholic lectionary. Again, the 30th Sunday of the year, reading one, a reading from the book of Exodus. Here we go. I'm reading directly from it. You shall not molest or oppress an alien, for you were once aliens yourselves in the land of Egypt. So it starts off with how you treat the stranger, the foreigner. You are not to molest or oppress. You're not to take advantage or abuse the stranger. Because Israel, you were once strangers yourselves in the land of Egypt. You shall not wrong any widow or orphan. If ever, if ever you wrong them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will flare up and I will kill you with the sword. Then your own wives will be widows and your children orphans. Wow, this is some serious threats. This is some serious, you will do the right thing or you will pay. If you lend money to one of your poor neighbors among my people, you shall not act like an extortioner towards him by demanding interest from him. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you shall return it to him before sunset. For this cloak of his is the only covering he has for his body. What else has he to sleep in? If he cries out to me, I will hear him for I am compassionate. This is the word of of the Lord. Now, immediately when I read that, I'm like, man, that is a strong law passage, right? That's coming at you hard with the law. And it, and it, and of course we would say, obviously we believe that it goes beyond just as very literal, but how you treat people, how you think about them, how you feel about them, right? And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
So there is Exodus 22, 20 through 26, as recorded in the Catholic lectionary. Now, when I read that, I'm like, okay, let me make sure. So I, I have an app on my iPad that um, I, I use quite frequently. Sometimes I forget that it's there. It's the Magnificat. The Magnificat, you can, you can download the app and subscribe. The Magnificat will give you the morning prayer, uh, a meditation, evening prayer, the lectionary. It gives you a lot. And, and the physical, if you ever order or subscribe to the physical copy of the Magnificat, it is beautiful. It is, uh, it is a beautiful publication with the artwork and everything. I, it's just beautiful. I love the physical copy of the Magnificat. It's a little expensive, but I do want to order myself another subscription to the Magnificat, uh, to the, um, to, uh, because they, they do an Advent, a special Advent uh, issue, a special uh, issue for Lent. It's beautiful. Now, yes, there's obviously, well, I mean, mostly it's just scripture, but obviously some things in there, obviously you can see the Catholicism. But just being able to follow the lectionary in a physical form and a beautiful thing that gets sent to you, you know, every month, it's, I think you get 12 uh, issues a year. But the Magnificat is a beautiful, I just, everything about that publication is just top notch quality and beautiful. But they also have an app. If you can't pay for the physical, you can, you can get the digital copy. And the digital copy, the app is very nice and very, very, very well done. So I opened up the, when I, when I looked at that, I'm like, I wonder what the Magnificat has to say. So I opened up the Magnificat and I'm like, okay, it's the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So I figured that out and I'm like, okay, the, uh, I'm going to go to mass, right? And then for mass, they have a reading from Exodus, Exodus chapter 22, 20 through 26. And I'm like, okay, I'm on to something. I'm on to something. All right. So I now know that I got the right place in the lectionary. That Magnificat, uh, makes it very clear that I'm in the right spot. Oh, say, so everything is good. Then I looked for the, um, the Psalm of the day, which is Psalm 18, and I'm like, okay. Then they have a pa- then the the reading for uh the 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 uh, well the first reading is from uh, Exodus chapter 22, 20 through twenty six, the Old Testament reading. Then you have Psalm eighteen. Then you have a reading from the first letter of Saint Paul to Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter one, verse five through ten. And all right, I'm looked at that. I'm like, oh, okay. There's there's something I could possibly do with that, all right? I could see a connection. And then I saw the gospel reading. A reading from the Holy Gospel, Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. So I'm going to read it from the physical lectionary right here. I'm going to turn the page. And here is the reading. You ready? We could read First uh, Thessalonians, but I don't want to get sidetracked and start trying to put all the readings together, show you how they're connected. Because, well, obviously, if we're putting this in our series on law and gospel, you see where this is going. Clearly, the first reading, Exodus 22, 20 through 26, that's very law. You will do this or you will die. All right, we, we got that. And then the gospel reading is this. Matthew 22, 34 through 40 a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. You shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself is the little statement underneath it, which serves as kind of a, a summary of what this is going to be about. So you know exactly what we're getting ready to read. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they assembled in a body and one of them, a lawyer, in an attempt to trip him up, asked him, teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, the whole law is based and the prophets as well. This is the gospel of the Lord. And immediately I was like, oh no, okay. Okay, these are strong law passages. And almost instantaneously, if you are, how can I say this? If you are willing to be very open and honest with yourself, if you're willing to sit before the scripture 
in a very open and honest way, reading Exodus 22 and reading Matthew 22, you should be immediately like, woe is me, I'm finished. Because whether we like it or not, sometimes we may not do anything to hurt the less fortunate. We may not do anything to hinder or oppress the less fortunate, but sometimes we can have some very negative, insensitive, just rude thinking about them, how they got themselves into that mess and why should I be bothered to help them? We can have some very negative thoughts. So immediately I'm like, okay, I may not be guilty of the physical thing that they're speaking of, but maybe mentally I'm guilty. But then when I get to the New Testament and read what Jesus have to, has to say, first, I'm supposed to love God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. I have never loved God that way. Neither have you. You never loved God that way before you were saved. You've never loved God that way after you're saved. But then I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. Do I really love other people? Because if I did, you know what I would always care about? Not hurting anyone, not using anyone, not taking advantage of anyone, always putting other people before me, putting what's what's best for other people before what's best for me, putting what other people need and want before maybe what I want. Immediately I'm like, I'm I'm done. I am condemned. And so I was just kind of sitting there. I'm like, well, man, this fits perfectly and kind of beautifully with what we're going to be talking about in in church. So then I went on to preach on Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. We talked about how in Christ we get the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness. That's an imputed righteousness. Praise God, because without that, you would see a person who is guilty of all of this today. So I'm like, okay, wow, that's that's all powerful. So I went on, had church, didn't think anything about it. Came home. I came home. So I'm going to I'm going to set the lectionary over to the side now. I'm going to set it down. I came home and when I was getting ready to eat lunch, I just grabbed my iPad and I just opened up the Magnificat. I just I had because the app was kind of already there. And I'm like, I wonder what the meditation of the day is. I mean, I I can at least look over the meditation of the day as I'm getting ready to eat. I could at least do that. So I clicked on meditation of the day. And I see this. The meaning of the law. And I'm like, well, there you go. The Magnificat is giving me a meditation that's great being pulled, obviously, from the Old Testament reading from Exodus uh, and Matthew. So because those are both law heavy. And I'm like, okay, I wonder what the meditation of the day is. The meaning of the law. This is, what, about three paragraphs long? You ready? You want to hear it? You want to hear it? Do you want to hear the meditation of the day and the and the from the Catholic app, the Magnificat, or the physical publication, depending whichever one one may be utilizing? But here is what it said. Now remember, I've I already was guilty, knew I was guilty of the Exodus passage and clearly the Matthew passage. There's no question about it. I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. What can I do? So when they talk about the meaning of the law, I wonder, okay, are they going to offer some kind of hope, some kind of grace? Are they going to offer something? And this is what I read. Christ did not come merely in order to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it as the giver of the new law. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Christ did not come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. Now, if we stop right there, okay, now I think we're talking biblical theology, but no, 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 no. Within Catholicism, Christ didn't do away with the law. He may have fulfilled it, but then he's the giver of a new law. See that old law. Yes, you're, you're not saved according to the works of the law, but that's the old law. Yes, the old law, you're not saved by keeping that. But Christ came to give a new law. He is a new Moses that brings a new law. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, wow. And so then I ran upstairs, 
grabbed my God's no and God's yes, the proper distinction between law and gospel by C.F.W. Walther. And I went to thesis number five. And thesis number five reads, the first manner of confounding law and gospel, the very first way in which law and gospel is confounded, confused, mixed, messed up, is the most easily recognized. The one that you should be able to recognize just like that is this. And it is the greatest way of confounding law and gospel. It is adopted, for instance, by the papist, the Socinians, the rationalist, and it consists in this, that Christ is represented as a new Moses or lawgiver, and the gospel turned into a doctrine of meritorious works. While at the same time, those who teach that the gospel is the message of the free grace of God in Christ are condemned and anathematized as is done by the papists. Now, please note, listen to that again. The very first And the greatest way of confounding law and gospel is when Christ is represented as a new Moses or a lawgiver. And then the gospel is turned into a doctrine of meritorious works. How? By keeping that new law. You got to keep the new law. No, no, no. You're not saved by the old law. See, yes, you're not saved according to works of the old law. But there is a new law that you must keep. Let's, let's, let's continue to read this. As soon as I saw this, I'm like, this is the best of a, of a hundred hours of teaching on law and gospel. Here we have today in Catholic churches all across the United States of America and the world, because they're all reading from the same lectionary. They're all hearing probably homilies that are going to somehow articulate law, 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 law. We can deal with this in a real way because we have now the theological framework to do this because we may, and that his followers must surpass the scribes and Pharisees in holiness. Now that is true. Jesus says your holiness must surpass the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He went on to say your holiness, you know what? You must be perfect as your heavenly father isn't perfect. You're absolutely right. Christ did articulate that. But you know what? By articulating that, he wasn't giving a new law. He's just restating the old law because the old law demanded you be holy as God is holy. The old law demanded perfection, which we will never keep. And when it says he came to fulfill it, he didn't come to fulfill the old law by giving us a new law. He came to fulfill it. And this is very important. This is the distinction by keeping it, by obeying it. So then when I put my faith in Christ, his obedience becomes mine. And therefore I have a perfect obedience that's imputed to me, not infused in me, imputed in me. And then guess what? I, my, my righteousness does surpass that of the Pharisees and the scribes because it's not my righteousness. It's an alien righteousness. It's a foreign righteousness. It's an imputed righteousness. It's the righteousness of the eternal son of God who was without sin and kept all the law on my behalf. But let's see where they take this. Now, the new law of Christ is an interior law, the law of grace. Now, when you call something the law of grace, I've got serious problems, but I do believe it is an interior law. I do believe. Now, when Christ gives us supposedly an interior law, I don't believe he's giving us a new law. He's articulating what the old law was calling for. He's just expounding the reality that the old law, you think that the old law only wanted Righteousness from an exterior point. No, God has always wanted more than just an exterior obedience. He's wanted the heart. He's wanted the the heart to be in it. He wanted internal obedience. Christ is only demonstrating that the law demands far more than you understood. And you can't keep. Look, they could not keep the old. They cannot keep Jesus explaining the old. You can't keep it. But they're saying Jesus brought a new law, a law of grace. (laughs) I don't know how law and grace are mixed there. He goes, it is more demanding than the old law. Now they come along and say, Jesus has a, has a new law that's even more demanding. Well, if the new law is more demanding than the old law, then there is, oh, there was no hope under the old. There would be definitely no hope under the new. Unless 
we have something going on here that we need to understand. All right. Unless we have something going on here that we need to understand. Okay. And if you're listening to us on um, Church One or Sermons 2.0, suppose I guess somehow we lost connection. I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, that happened also this morning during uh, the worship service. But we're going to con- continue on because we're we're still okay on the Spreaker platform. All right. So let's continue. Let's continue. All right. Hopefully we don't have any connection issues issues here. So here we go. Now. It is more demanding than the old law. It requires us to sacrifice ourselves so that Christ may animate everything that we do so that he may quite truly be our life. So, see, the new law demands that you completely sacrifice yourself. You completely sacrifice yourself. Completely. I don't know exactly how that is supposed to work. I don't know how you're supposed to completely sacrifice yourself, but that that's what they're claiming. You have to sacrifice yourself. Wait, so how am I ever going to pull that off? How am I ever going to pull that off? They continue to say this. Um, let me find it. Following the most ancient of insights by the Christian community, the church's baptismal liturgies repeatedly connect our baptism to Christ's death and resurrection. Through baptism, we become changed, sealed with what theologians called the the indelible character of baptism we've put on Christ. So then they look to a sacrament. They look to a sacrament. Hey, hey, Christ demands this. Now, the way you get the indelible character placed upon you is baptism, where then they believe somehow you're going to be infused. See, now they're not talking an imputed righteousness. They're talking something is happening. Indelibly, something is happening on you and in you, which somehow is going to help you keep this new law. They go on. All right. The idea was already present in Christ's own preaching. On several occasions, the gospel present us with the story of a young adherent to the law, asking what he must do to attain eternal life. Christ looks to the young man with a loving glance, sees his devotion, and tells him that there's merely one thing to do. The young man must sell everything and follow him, leaving behind family and friends. In short, Christ demands everything of him, every fiber of his being, every relationship. But in compensation, he gives all things. As St. Paul would later proclaim, all things are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. Now, please note, they're saying then what Christ was doing to the rich young ruler was saying, the only way you get eternal life is you have to do this. You've got to sell everything and give up everything. Then you'll have eternal life because that's what the new law demands. Well, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if the new law demands, demands that no one is saved, not even within Catholicism, because they don't do that. They don't. Next paragraph. The new law is indeed a law of freedom. Above all, a freedom to pursue the most profound thing we are called to love, God himself. I don't see how this is a law of freedom. It's not a law of freedom. It's a law of condemnation. And the fact that Catholicism teaches that somehow you can achieve it, somehow you can obtain it, somehow you can do it because you've been basically indelibly the the character of Christ has been put on you in baptism. That's that's the idea of their, their concept of an infused righteousness. And now you're free to fulfill this law, but nobody fulfills the law. Nobody does. And even Catholics admit no one does. That's why you have to go to confession. That's why you have to do penance. And oh, that's why you're going to go to purgatory. But everyone always says you can do it. Now, trust me, don't condemn Catholicism here. Protestants take the same concept and say, now that you are in Christ, boom, you now have supernatural power. You have new supernatural strength. You have supernatural ability. You now can keep the law. And guess what? How do you prove you're saved? Because you keep the law. And guess what? If you don't keep the law enough, you prove you were never saved. So in a roundabout way, it's a modified version of Catholicism. They go on to say, this new law is indeed a law of freedom above all a freedom to pursue the most profound thing we are called to love God himself in him. 
uh, the God who is goodness and love. Our hearts find their true fulfillment, their, uh, their true perfection and their true joy. And the beautiful words with which uh, Dante closes the divine con- comedy, God is the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Thus, we see the meaning of the well-known words of Christ spoken after he washed the disciples' feet. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This is a sign of being Christ's disciple. It is a, 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 it is a lofty bar, for we, for we are called to love with that same love that impelled Christ to the cross for our sakes. As St. John writes elsewhere, we love because he first loved us. We might rephrase this and say, in your love, Christ, we see love. And then that's how the meditation ends. Now, I, I would challenge you. Take that meditation. Give it to 50 Christian friends, you know. Just send it to people who you go to Sunday school with, who go to church with. You know how many people will read that and go, amen. Post it on social media. Amen. This is beautiful. And it, and, and I, and, and like, I don't even want to know how many of your Christian friends send it to your pastors. How many of your pastors will say, that is awesome. That is beautiful. No, it's not. It's an complete, complete obliteration of everything the Protestant Reformation stood for. The Protestant Reformation stood for is Christ didn't come to bring a new law. Christ came to fulfill the law on our behalf. And in him, all law is fulfilled because we are in Christ and that he did not come to infuse use a righteousness to us, but impute a righteousness to us by faith. And the hope of my salvation is not what I do, can do, should do, may do. It's in what Christ did. But Protestants will read this and go, absolutely true. God has given us a new law and we can do it. This is, this is typical Christian preaching. Now that you're a Christian, what do we say? The old is gone. Everything is new. And we believe that to be true practically, not positionally. And now you can do it. You can say no to sin. You can say yes to God. You can do it. 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 And guess what? If you're not doing enough, if you're not demonstrating enough, if you're not fulfilling, I mean, even if you look at say MacArthur's test and other people's tests to know how you're saved. They don't point you to the finished work of Jesus Christ. They point you to to what you're doing. Do you love God? Do you love others? Do you hate sin? Are you pursuing holiness? Do you love the word of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you look at your life and you've got to convince yourself that you're doing it to such a level that somehow proves you're saved. But to what level could you do any of that to prove you're saved? Because God's law, Old Testament, and Christ's explanation of the law demands perfection externally and internally. So no matter what you say you're doing or not doing, it would only prove that you are condemned. We have to look to the finished work of Christ, nothing else. And this tells us Christ was a new, he's basically a new Moses with a new law. And so yes, Catholics will say, you're not saved by keeping the law. The old law. But there is a new law, and it's the law of Christ. Now, what Protestants say is, no, we're not saved by keeping the new law, but it's in keeping the new law that we prove we are saved. And if we don't keep the new law, then we prove we're not saved, meaning you have to keep the new law in order to be saved, which is basically Catholicism. (laughs) And, And Christians don't get it. The number one way and which law and gospel is confounded is the very way that is present in churches all across America. And it's almost burned into the brains of Christian friends and people you go to church with and probably people in your own family. Again, let me read from CFW Walther, thesis number five. The first man- manner of confounding law and gospel is the one most easily recognized and it is the grossest. It is adopted, for instance, by the Papists, the Socinians, and the Rationalists. And it consists in this, that Christ is represented as a new Moses or lawgiver. And the gospel is turned into a doctrine of meritorious works. And that is exactly what happens. That's what this meditation, this is what the lectionary is pointing you to today. Hey, how do you treat the unfortunate? How do you how do you treat the weak, the poor, the downtrodden? How do you treat them? How do you think about them? 
You better think about them right because Christ tells us, because then Christ takes the law and expand, not really expands it, expounds it and says, you know what you're supposed to do? Not only are you not supposed to mistreat them, not only are you not to take advantage of them, not only are you not to abuse them or hurt them, you are to love them as you love yourself. Now, that means immediately I know I'm condemned. Now, thank goodness, Christ kept all of that for me. So then I can be like, praise God, I am clothed in the garments of salvation, clothed in a robe of righteousness because of what Christ did in his imputed righteousness. Now, I am to be convicted by how I treat other people. And I should see how sinful I am. And then guess what I should do? Try my best to forget what has occurred, turn and move forward and press towards the mark. And that mark is loving people the way I should putting others before me, loving God supremely. Do I love God more than I love what I want and desire? And I, every single day, love what I want and desire more than I love God. And I guess what? I love what I want more than I love other people. But this meditation in the Magnificat today, that's that's pure, that's Catholicism in, in its most pure form. But when I read it, that could be published and printed in church bulletins pretty much across the United States of America. And Christians, you know, maybe even your own pastor would be like, that's a powerful one. That's convicting. That's convicting. And not even catch on to what they just did. Christ didn't come to give us a new one. He came to fulfill it all. And He came to fulfill it all. That's the key. If he doesn't fulfill it all, we're doomed. If there's this new law that we have to keep in order to be saved or even in order to prove we're saved, we're going to fall short. Whenever Christ speaks of commandments, it's just a, it, all it is is an, 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 an exposition, an explanation, a revealing the true intent of the old law. Because the old law told you how to treat people. The old law told you how to love. The old law told you how to, you're supposed to love God. Very important concept. Very important concept. And I wanted to articulate this clearly. And so I, I'm just going to leave it there. And I want you to think about it. If um, I'm, I, I I don't know if this uh, meditation is copyrighted in any way, shape, or form. I would like to to post it somewhere because I really challenge you to take that meditation and 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 just see if your Christian friends and family and and people you go to church with what they would think about it. I bet you they would think it's great, and which is frightening because they're literally that's the number one way the long gospel is confounded. And, and, and it corrupts the, it basically it corrupts the gospel and you're left with law. But I guarantee you Christians all over the place would say, oh, that's so good. That's so good. And it's like, but yet they go to a non-Catholic church and many of them will say, it's October 31st. It's Reformation Day. You don't even believe in the Reformation. You violate the entire Reformational concept and you look more far, far, you have a Christianity that is far more committed to an infused righteousness than an imputed righteousness because you demand that people meet, a, pass a certain test to prove that they're saved. Well, if you want to give me a test to prove that I'm saved, look to Jesus. He passed it. But you destroy the gospel, yet claiming to be reformed, yet claiming some lineage to the Reformation when you're literally giving me Roman Catholicism in disguise. And then when people say, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know. Going to a Catholic university and pursuing a degree in Catholic theology. I have no clue what I'm referencing. No clue what I'm talking about. There it is right here in a Catholic meditation of the day. All right. I'll stop there. Oh, I'm, I'm, oh, there's so much I want to do. So much I want to do. I, w- I want to go back and read all of the lectionary. Read. I, I, there's so much we could just spend some time doing, but I at least wanted to just present this to you kind of like oh, almost like a today's focus, but we're doing this for the long gospel. Here you go. Here's a good example of what we've been talking about. These hundred plus hours of lectures haven't been for naught. hasn't been for nothing. It hasn't because I just wanted to hear me speak. 
It's, it's, it's a direct response to the Roman Catholicism that is alive and well, most likely in your church. And nobody can see it because we just change the language a little bit. We just use different language, but in reality, we don't even know it when it's there. Now, I will end with this. If you are listening to us on Church One, Sermons 2.0, Sermon uh, Beta, uh, beta.sermonaudio.com, uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, that whole thing just crashed for a long period of time. My uh, software here turned red. Everything else was working perfectly. Um, that's the second time that's happened today. It crashed this morning. So, and that's two different locations, two different internet connections. I, I don't know what's exactly going on, but um, what we will do as soon as this broadcast is over, this will be uploaded to those uh, platforms, and then you can listen to the whole thing, all right? You can listen to the whole thing at that point in time, all right? It'll be there probably within five minutes of us ending. Oh, maybe give us six minutes. It'll be there as soon as I can get it there, all right? I do apologize for those technical problems. Sometimes I can control them. Sometimes I cannot. Um, we do have, you know, weather in the area and sometimes Texas, <laughs> it, it gets below 50 and everything in Texas is like, that's it. We're shutting down. <laughs> okay. So I do apologize for that. If for any reason you can't, uh, well, it'll be uploaded here in just a few minutes. You shouldn't have any problem. All right. There you have it. Please understand the proper distinction between law and gospel so that you don't find yourself embracing a gospel that is really not a gospel. It's Catholic, it's Catholicism, it's Catholic theology, and it's law masquerading as a gospel, which leads you with a false gospel. Again, you can email me, newsif at yahoo.com. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great evening. God bless.